Uh, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I was very excited to be invited to this. Um, and uh, I just want to apologize in advance. The presentations till now have been uh, really, uh, really crisp and neat. So I just want to apologize for my amateur slides and uh, awkward demeanor up here. Um, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you come away uh, learning something. Probably not as acoustic experts, but with some acoustic considerations top of mind and some uh, potential solutions and, uh, and ideas. Uh, so, as I said, I'm, I'm, my name is Stephen McCann. I'm with Thor Thornton Tomasetti in the Acoustic and Noise Control Group. Uh, Thornton Tomasetti is, we have about uh, 1,500 employees worldwide uh, in over 45 countries. Um, and in North America, it's about 30 offices, um, including Two in the GTA, so in Toronto, we have a, a structural-centric um, office, and uh, in Mississauga is where our acoustics and noise control group works out of. Uh, we offer a wide range of engineering solutions, mostly in the uh, um, architecture, engineering, and construction industry, uh, but a few uh, adjacent industries as well, um, such as uh, healthcare, defense, energy, um, and fortunately for me, our group sits right at the top due to some nice alphabetic um, karma. Uh, so what do we do as acoustic engineers? Um, essentially, how we see the world is a cacophony of all the noises everywhere around you. And our goal is to help you see the world as your own space, how you need to see it. You get to live, be yourself in your space, your neighbor gets to be themselves in their space, and we avoid the conflicts and everybody all lives happily together, ideally. Uh, so just quickly, we're gonna, I mean, what we're gonna talk about, um, the physics of acoustics in, uh, in mass timber buildings is basically the same as the physics of acoustics in every other building. The difference is the predominance of wood, which means, and I apologize for those of you who are familiar with the subject, we're gonna start off with some Acoustics 101. Uh, we'll talk then a little bit about sound, sound isolation and that will start to uh, move into the um, mass timber specific conditions um, and, and considerations. We're going to talk about some mechanical noise considerations, but it won't be in the way that you think. And I will talk a bit about room acoustics as well. That'll only be one slide, but it's an important slide, and I hope you're still awake then. Sound 101. What is sound? It's basically a mechanical wave traveling through solid, liquid, or gas. And from our perspective, you can hear it. That is the important part of sound. Um, it's a compression wave, uh, at least on the sound uh, side of things. So think the compression waves of a slinky, not the surface waves in water. The other side of what we do in vibration, that's when a lot of those surface waves do come into play. Um, I won't be talking about too much of that today. That is really a, a whole separate um, specialty in, in what we're doing. Frequency is, of course, the important part, or an important part given in cycles per second or hertz. A decibel, one-tenth of a bell. Not very useful. Uh, it was originally miles of standard cable, which is this long uh, description. Essentially, it matched the smallest attenuation detectable to the average human ear. That was then updated to be the transmission unit, which was essentially the same, but used um, a logarithmic, logarithmic ratio uh, based on a reference pressure. That was renamed the Bell in honor of Alexander Graham Bell, a fantastic Canadian. The decibel soon became the standard basically to give easier numbers to work with. Um, it uses logarithmic math, which I promise is real math. So what that means, plus 10 dB generally to most people would say sounds twice as loud um, if, if you get an increase of 10 decibels but it works out to be three times the pressure. And conversely, doubling the pressure gives you an increase of 
three decibels, or doubling the sound energy, I should say, gives you an increase of three decibels. And again, it is real math. Um, obviously, what we hear is a very wide range of, uh, of sound, which is why we do use the decibels, um, ranging from a quiet bedroom at about 20, 20 to 30 uh, dB. Um, you know, your average office sits at around 50. That's, that's where your general hum is. If you're closer to somebody speaking, you could be getting that more like uh, 60 dB. And a bus passed by, if you're standing nearby, you would experience that at about 100. Um, that's assuming that it's an you know, internal combustion engine. Um, fortunately, those things are getting a bit quieter now. If we look at it in pressure, that's about a 10 million times pressure range. Those are obviously very difficult numbers to work with. The decibel works. What frequencies can we hear? Most humans hear between about 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Um, this varies with age and a number of other factors. Uh, I know myself, I top out at around 15,000 hertz. I haven't tested the bottom mostly because uh, I don't have any speakers that can go down that low. Um, as far as acousticians go, for the most part, we're not we don't work a whole lot with those extremes, the very high frequencies and the very low frequencies. It's not to say they don't come up, um, but you can think of what, what we work in is generally the range that you can hear on a full-size piano from your bottom A to your high C. We don't hear all frequencies the same. Uh, we're generally much less sensitive to low frequency sound. And as a result, we use what we call a-weighted decibels, which essentially levels out the playing field for all frequencies so that when we talk 50 dBA, whether we're talking a low frequency sound or a high frequency sound, it'll sound to you as the same loudness. A wavelength is defined as the distance between your waves, essentially, and you can calculate that with the speed of sound divided by your frequency. As a quick example, 10,000 hertz has a wavelength of about 34 millimeters. A 30 hertz sound has a wavelength of about 11 meters. <laughs> that nice fan <laughs> was so upset because there's a direct connection between wavelength and acoustic and noise treatment. To isolate for low frequency sounds, your treatments have to be big. It's much easier to provide treatments for high frequency sounds. Most of the, um, most of the graphs that you'll see will be showing you uh, decibels on the vertical axis and frequency on the horizontal axis and now into sound isolation. We'll talk generally first and then we'll move into what this means in, uh, in mass timber structures. What is the purpose of sound isolation? As we said before, it's isolating your noisy spaces, um, protecting sensitive spaces. I like to just talk about acoustic privacy and we can divide that sort of into um, sort of two levels of, uh, of, of noise control. In the sort of middle of the road, noise control, we're talking speech privacy, freedom from distraction, at the more um, higher end levels of noise control. Uh, you know, we're talking uh, about your freedom to make whatever noise you want, whether you're a diesel generator um, or a band, and on the other end of that, the freedom to sleep in a cone of silence. Every sound has a source. We only care about it if it has a receiver as well, and where we do our work is along the path from the source to the receiver. Every source will get to the receiver along a path. There'll be dozens of paths involved. Um, a lot of our work that we do involves looking at all of the paths, starting with you know, the most significant ones, but making sure that those other lesser paths aren't forgotten about, um, which could render whatever work you've done uh, almost meaningless. When we talk about noise reduction or transmission loss, that's where we're applying um, our noise reduction is along that, the sound path. Some common ratings, I'm sure you've all heard about your sound transmission class. 
An important thing to remember about sign transmission class is it is based on speech. And so that means that it's sort of limited to the frequencies, or it only really considers your frequencies 125 hertz to 4,000 hertz, which is really your mid-range um, mid frequencies. It does not consider low frequency sound. So when somebody asks me what, um, what STC rating do we need for our uh, diesel generator room, it's not really applicable. We're not gonna talk about STC ratings in that context. If you ask me what STC rating you need between these two meeting rooms, that one we can talk about. Some other ratings or lab ratings versus field ratings. Um, STC rating is tested in the lab, which essentially means that your controlled environment, what you're testing is only the assembly that you want to test and there's no um, contamination, if you will, from other sound paths. Field sound transmission class was an attempt to recreate the lab rating in the field. Thankfully, almost nobody uses it anymore because it really was a pain. Um, the apparent sound transmission class is the one that has been embraced, which really just represents what is being experienced in the field. And that includes all your flanking paths. So if, you, if we're testing this wall, it would include the flanking path along the ceiling, along the floor, along both intersecting walls, any penetrations through the combination of that skyfold wall and uh, the other wall adjacent to it. It takes into account everything. It's really what you experience, your apparent sound transmission class. Your noise isolation class is very much similar, but where your apparent sound transmission class tries to normalize it um, based on your room geometries and absorption, your noise insulation class does not. So um, you, you could end up with, with some uh, significantly varying results um, between the two. Generally, we can assume an ASTC rating would be three to five points below the laboratory STC rating. An NIC rating could be as much as 10 points below for a perfectly well-constructed partition. Uh, these ratings are ultimately single numbers um, of your composite transmission loss across a range of frequencies fit to a standardized curve and the value at 500 hertz of that standardized curve is your STC rating. What does that mean and what does it sound like? Um, again, we're talking real, mostly on speech here. Uh, and so if we're talking at the, at the lower end, um, gets much lower than STC 40, uh, we try to avoid that. Uh, at that level, you're still clearly clearly noticing raised speech and often, at oftentimes um, speech is intelligible. So you don't really have that speech privacy. At STC 45, that basic level of privacy starts to kick in. Um, and then up to STC 55, for the most part, you should not be hearing um, your, your neighbors and you should be feeling very confident on your speech privacy. I'm gonna come back to this later because there is a caveat to this table. Other ratings, your impact insulation class is your footfall noise. Um, this one is quite significant in mass timber buildings. And the important thing with your IIC rating is that it really applies to your entire assembly. If a supplier tells you that their acoustic underlayment achieves IIC 60, it's kind of meaningless unless it matches the assembly that you're looking for in terms of the floor structure and your floor finish, whatever ceiling is below. It has to match all of that information. Another common one is the ceiling attenuation class, which is given to ceiling tiles when we have a common plenum. It essentially is equivalent to your STC rating, except we're assuming that all of the sound that's being transferred is going through the ceiling plenum. In mass timber structures, this is becoming sort of less of an important rating a lot of the time because we're having the exposed ceiling structures. Um, but what we do have is the upside down version of that, which does not have a rating, um, at least that I know of with raised access floors and the walls sitting there. You know, we have a common plenum there. It's a bit nicer because your 
raised access floors generally have much, uh, much more density than ceiling tiles. Um, so it, it's not as much of a problem, but it is something that does need to be considered. How do we achieve transmission loss? First step, mass. We need mass. Light materials do not block sound very well, so we need some mass. We're going to start here with just looking at what one layer of drywall that gives to us, and then if we double that, we get a reasonable increase of you know six, uh, six STC points. We double that again, we get another six STC points, seeing that every time we double, we're getting that uh, about six STC point increase. Obviously, we can't increase the mass uh, indefinitely, so the next step, we add an air gap, and all of a sudden, we're jumping way up. Um, and you see, as we increase the size of that, that STC rating is increasing as well. That goes back to our comment about um, wavelength and uh, noise isolation. So as we increase the size of that assembly, our low frequency is beginning to be attenuated more, and that STC rating can rise with that. Next step is absorptive material, um, and that really jumps it up a lot higher. And again, then decoupling, whether that's uh, acoustic pads sitting between your pre-manufactured uh, uh, pods um, or separating studs, what have you, uh, resilient channel, isolation clips, um, that separation uh, goes a long way. Once we're here, what do we do next? We go back to mass, and, uh, and we can start again. If we were to just look at mass alone to get those ratings, we're talking pretty thick and heavy, um, heavy components. So you know, compare a uh, your 10-inch concrete wall to get your STC 60 versus um, a, uh, a just a double stud assembly or so. The, the mass or the weight that you're putting on your structure is, there's a, there's a big difference there. Vertical separations are basically the same thing. We can talk about a floating floor to get that extra level of uh, isolation or a floating ceiling to get that extra level of isolation. <clears throat> floating floors cannot be counted on for vibration isolation. You still need to consider, when you're thinking of your clearances, you still need to consider housekeeping pad on top of that, your isolators on top of that. Um, you can't just put your equipment directly on your floating slab. So that is something to take into account when uh, you're looking at your clearances in your mechanical rooms, for instance. So what's the deal with wood? Well, we look again with the mass. We've got our six inch, uh, six inch floor slab. We're getting about STC 54, IIC 28. That's not super great with the IIC, but the STC rating is, is looking pretty good. It's a little lower when we get composite deck. We go to uh, you know, seven ply CLT and we're dropping way down. Uh, we've got about STC 40. Um, our IIC rating is basically the same. For the most part, that's because the IIC rating is very, very dependent on the, um, the surface finish of your floor. So what does this mean? It means either the floor or the ceiling needs to be treated. Um, that's generally not too much of a problem. I haven't really come across many um, or any yet uh, projects where, uh, where the, the designers are looking for both exposed ceilings and the original CLT floor. Inevitably, there's gonna be something covering one of those surfaces, but usually the floor, so I'm gonna talk about that. Um, if we compare uh, just a, a plain floor with a little bit of uh, um, leveling gypsum board and a finish, if you're putting that stuff on top of your floor, you may as well just take the time, put in an underlayment as well. That gives us, um, for the most part, our IIC rating. It helps with the STC rating as well, um, although the additional mass is contributing more to that. Um, just to take another to go that uh, how the your your floor finish affects your IIC rating. Um, what we have is here essentially two very similar 
um, floor builds ups, the difference being that the floor finish has a little bit more um, impact isolation there. Um, and that, that's giving quite a big difference in the IIC rating. The STC rating is, of course, not changing much at all. And if we take it to a floating floor situation, um, now we can get a much higher STC rating. But you'll notice again, the IIC rating is dropped down because here we're looking at just a concrete finish. So there we have that floor finish. The IIC rating is very sensitive to your floor finish. You put a very thin carpet on that floor and suddenly your IIC rating is going to be in the 70s and 80s. Um, on the raised access floor side of things, it really does help for your vertical attenuation. Um, and you see the STC ratings are going up nicely. To get the IIC rating up, you need that uh, acoustic or that isolation um, between your, your raised floor assembly, whether that's um, a, an acoustic board, uh, such as the, the, the Plytech board here, um, or some of the integrated um, acoustic pads uh, that a lot of uh, raised access floor manufacturers provide to give that isolation um, at, at the pedestals. Uh, this is just a high level case study that uh, I want to quickly talk about. Um, it's still in design and unfortunately the design has shifted from here, but this was a fitness floor um, that we we're looking for some very high level of, of isolation. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. When we're talking IIC ratings, we're really talking about footfall noise. Um, an IIC, if you're going to drop a bowling ball or do Olympic deadlifts, that IIC rating is meaningless. This is for uh, a police headquarters, and they wanted to make sure that their staff could do whatever they want in their fitness room, including Olympic lifts and dropping that on the floor. Um, and so, so we really did have to look at a much higher level of, of, of isolation. What we did here, on top of the, the, the general floating floor um, approach, in that we, we have the, uh, we've got the isolated sitting below, below the beams there, and then uh, a composite deck sitting on that with another layer of uh, fitness flooring on that. But what we did specifically with the isolators, um, the beams were sitting in two parts, and so that the isolators only needed to be located around the columns and very close to the columns. Um, so that the beams were essentially spanning the full bay without any intermediate isolators. That way, all the impact energy was being transferred right to the columns where the floor is stiff. Um, you drop 200 pounds on that, it's still going to make noise and get transferred through, uh, but it will be a lot less. Um, and the other side of that is the vibration. It's much stiffer there. There won't be as much visible vibration um, that, that you can get from those large, large impacts. Some mechanical considerations. I'm going to talk about low pressure plenums. Um, there we go. We've got our, uh, our flanking path going under the plenum. And the solution, um, you know, when, when we're talking about sealing plenums, um, the solution tends to be put a baffle, right? Either that's a drywall baffle or a rigid insulation baffle, something like a baffle. It's harder to do um, with low pressure plenums, floor plenums, um, because of the interruption of the, the disruption of the airflow. So this typical, for the most part, the only solution that has been accepted by the mechanical engineers has been the sort of offset staggered, um, staggered baffle. Um, and even that can only be done on three sides and they want one side fully open. Um, and there's a lot of consideration uh, for the mechanical engineer to ensure that uh, the, the supply um, outlets 
are well located to ensure that constant uh, pressure is being transferred into all of the spaces. For much noisier situations, um, we, we have done a, a partition to deck uh, situation. Um, in these cases, in that case, it did require supplemental fans. Uh, the other side of it was that it was only possible to be done on a room that was located on a perimeter corner um, because that was the only place where it, wouldn't, it still wouldn't be blocking the airflow in the, in the low pressure plenum. When we're talking about background noise levels, the most common rating um, that we talk about is the, the NC rating. Um, typically, uh, if, if you're talking, say, office spaces, we're designing NC30 to NC40, with your NC30 being your, uh, your conference room, uh, 35 being a private office, and your 40 being your open office. And what we traditionally had to do was provide a lot of noise control in the mechanical system to bring the noise from the mechanical system down to those levels. Um, a trend that we've seen has been with the with, you know with these very low pressure systems that we aren't putting any noise control into the mechanical system and we're getting very low noise levels um, in, in the NC25 to NC35 range. That's good, right? Not so quick. Because this table describing our perception of STC ratings and privacy is based on an assumption of a background noise level of about NC35. When we drop that background noise level, this whole table is impacted. The new uh, uh, metric um, that's uh, sort of making its way, becoming popular right now is speech privacy potential, which takes our noise insulation class added to your background NC level, and that gives you a speech privacy uh, or your SPP rating. Um, and so here we got from SPP 60 to 65 is really not a lot of privacy, up to 80 plus, which gives us a lot of privacy. What does this mean? If we assume that our NIC rating is 10 points below our STC rating, this table here shows us what, you know, what, how that partition STC um, relates to your background noise to give you your privacy. What we were getting before when we were talking NC35, NC40 in office environments um, with an STC45 wall, for instance, we were in that good privacy range, getting that basic privacy. With those background noise levels dropping much lower, that same partition is not providing the same level of privacy that it once was. What's the solution? Either we increase the partition STC, or we increase the background noise. Either are fine solutions. Um, point here is to consider this. Something to consider in all your line, in all your budgets, include a line item for sound masking. It could be very useful once your project is completed. Consider it earlier on, having that consistent background noise level gives you that certainty of the speech privacy um, that, uh, that you're targeting. That was our mechanical noise considerations. As I told you, not what you thought it was gonna be. So now room acoustics. Room acoustics, when we talk room acoustics, we're talking about how the sound within a room um, behaves, how it's bouncing off the walls, ceilings, whether it's absorbed, diffused, uh, reflecting back and forth. Um, unless we're talking about uh, you know, a recording studio or a um, concert hall, when we talk room acoustics, we're generally talking sound absorption. So in mass timber structures, we hear a comment, wood is more absorptive than concrete, right? Yes, it is, but let's take a look. Um, if we look at our concrete, which has a noise reduction coefficient of 0 0.1, very close to zero, um, your NRC rating is uh, it's how much sound, uh, the percentage of sound that is absorbed, with zero being nothing absorbed, one being 100% absorbed. 
uh, the that concrete does, the, there is in fact a, a curve there shown. Uh, you might not see it as it's basically sitting on that, vertic on that horizontal axis. Um, we take drywall, it's a little, little more absorptive than wood is, yes, a little more absorptive than concrete. Let's compare that to an acoustic product such as your ceiling tile, um, which is 95% you know, absorptive on the higher range of things. Now you may look at that and say, okay, but if we have a full, you know, a full ceiling of wood, um, you know, surely that adds up. Well, let's look at it upside down and think instead of how much is being absorbed, think of how much is being reflected. Um, your NRC 0.95 ceiling is reflecting 5% of the sound that is coming in. Uh, your NRC 0.15 wood is reflecting 85% of that sound. So your wood is 17 times more reflective than that ACT. By comparison, your concrete is 1.2 times more reflective than your wood. That's, in acoustics, pretty much the same. Um, you're, you're not really getting any more uh, reflection, or oh, any less reflections or more absorption um, when you're talking about those very low levels of absorption. The point of this is you still have to include for acoustic finishes in your design. If you have an exposed ceiling, you need to include for whether that's um, you know, something on the wall, ceiling baffles. There are so many products out now, it's very fashionable to be an acoustic finish provider these days. Um, there are dozens of options. Um, Actually missed an opportunity, I realized, when Ty spoke earlier uh, with the, the Bayview campus, the Toronto Montessori School Bayview campus, um, and Ty, Ty showed some uh, really nice photos of uh, the, the, that lobby with those beautifully curved um, wood and the exposed ceiling and the, you know, the, the triangle, um, triangle shapes. What I didn't see um, was on the one wall, those triangle shapes uh, were carried over onto the wall with some acoustic panels alternating between uh, triangular acoustic, large triangular acoustic walls and large triangular um, windows, glass walls. Um, and it, it was really a good example, I think, of uh, maintaining that wood aesthetic, keeping uh, all that exposed wood um, and having the acoustic panels uh, put in in a really nice um, aesthetic way. Uh, I'm, I'm very aware that your interior design does not include acoustic panels and that it's, uh, it's ruining it. There is always a solution um, and it can be done really nicely. And that, that project was a really good example. It was a very warm feeling in there um, and, and the acoustics turned out very well. One more section. Uh, that I like to call You Can Stop Acoustic Accidents. Um, and we're going to go back to our floors. In here, we're going to look at, we're really interested in the IIC rating. Um, so in this assembly that we have here, uh, we, we, you know, we've got a, a three-ply CLT over a genie mat with another three-ply CLT, a thicker one. Um, and we've got an okay IIC rating. The important thing about this assembly that's shown here, no nails. That acoustic underlayment is being continuous, uninterrupted, and uh, nothing going through there. Test data with nails put in, our IIC rating drops quite significantly. And as you increase how many nails are going in there, our IIC rating can be taken out completely. So please stop nailing through the isolators. And in summary, isolate all the things. <laughs> and there we go. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks. So we have a, we'll take a few minutes for questions, maybe five minutes or so, if there's a couple questions from the audience to Stephen before we'll move on to the next part of the conference. Any questions? Yeah. 
Hi, thanks, Stephen. That was a very good talk. Uh, I also work in acoustics, so <laughs> I have kind of a two-part question. Um, one is, how do you think um, it's very important to get the um, acoustic considerations in very early in design? There's a lot of considerations with connections, um, which can lead to structural and other sort of um, technical aspects being affected. What in your experience is the way of ensuring that the acoustic considerations get in from the beginning of the design rather than the owner or architect uh, coming along later? And the second part of my question is, what do you do when that hasn't happened? I was talking with a colleague recently who mentioned a project in the US called the Ascent Tower. I think it's a really, I think you guys did that, and I think there were some post occupancy problems. So, what would be, you know, the solutions if that design, acoustic design, did not happen early enough? Um, so, to the first question, really it comes down to early engagement of your acoustic consultant. Um, as acoustic consultants, we don't have a lot of control over when we get engaged. Um, we're at the mercy of whether it's the architect, uh, the project manager, wherever it is taking on managing that project to engage the consultants. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, all too often we're engaged at the end, we're, you know, 95% CDs. Hey, can you take a look at this and give us some recommendations before we issue 100% next week? That's, you know, that, that, that's very difficult. So the key is that early engagement um, and starting actually engaging when you get that early engagement, starting off with those meetings, really beginning to understand what the intent of the, uh, um, what, what, the what the client's ultimately looking for um, in their acoustic environments. And sometimes that means saying, hey, you don't actually need to do all of this. Um, you know, the, the client is looking for a cone of silence when really they just need a bit of privacy. Um, and so really getting to understand what it is that the client or the end user specifically um, is, is looking for and is needing um, and understanding all of the spaces that are involved in the building. Um, you know, we, we can design uh, some offices really nicely. It turns into some big problems if there's a fitness floor, you know, right above or not even right above, two floors above, three floors above. Um, you know, those, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of spaces can cause just so much problems uh, down the line. So understanding all of those spaces early on. As to what can be done when, it's, when that early engagement is not there, um, it, a couple things. Um, the first part is looking at your your sources of noise, and I guess it depends on you know when when that uh, late engagement comes in. If it's you know if it's before before procurement, for instance, then we can look at the sources of noise. We can look at the mechanical data, and we can try to fix that or get that um, the, the the noise reduction at the source. Right? I, I mentioned earlier that we mostly look at the sound path. We can look at the source as well. Um, and we have been able to get, uh, you know, large mechanical units um, working with the manufacturers to uh, add plenums, add walls, um, you know, do, do, to bring the actual noise levels down at the source um, before it went in. Um, when that's possible, you know, that, that's always a good solution. Um, Beyond that, I mean, it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a little hard to, to give some, uh, some, some best ideas. Um, often it comes down to, you know, what, what is the end user really looking for? What are their priorities? Um, and how much money are they willing to spend? Um, yeah. That, that's, you know, it's, I mean, I think it's tough when we're coming very We would agree, right, that it's yeah. like, it might seem excessive to bring your acoustic consultant in early, but actually you're going to save yourself a lot of money if you engage early, Absolutely. rather than yeah, waiting for the problems to manifest later. I agree, and I mean, and with as acoustic consultants, we we we're not working 
continuously through the life of a project. If we come in really early at concept or schematic design, you know, we're putting in a bit of time there, giving a report, giving some information um, to, you know, to, to build on, and then we sit tight for you know, a month, two months, and then we come back in again. Hey, have you done everything that we recommended? Okay, yes, no. Okay, let's work on this one, right? And then we sit tight again, and then we come back in CDs. Hey, have you done this, right? It's, it's not a continuous engagement, so adding that early engagement isn't a huge cost, um, and compared to the cost of your overall project, it, it really is almost nothing. Um, there's, no, there's no reason not to, uh, and I agree, it can save a lot of money and headaches down the road. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Can we ask one more question if someone wants to jump in there? Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you could go into more detail about sound masking, uh, especially in like a residential setting. Sound masking in residential settings is not common. Um, it's not something that I've done personally or recommended personally. I know um, it's, it is often floated out there. The important thing to know about sound masking is that you really you are adding sound to a space. You're adding noise. Um, and I mean, I mean, I'm not sure that it's completely wrong to put it in a residential setting. Um, I think in residential settings, there are generally other solutions that can make more sense um, and are more feasible um, to, to, to address that. The other thing with sound masking is that it's, it doesn't, um, it's not noise canceling, right? You still hearing the noise, you're still hearing the, the talking coming from next door or whatever it is. Um, and it's really intended for freedom from distraction to avoid that distraction. Um, uh, an office project that I worked on um, a little while back, we, they, they had done a survey of all their, uh, all their office staff in the open office, in open office space. They were complaining about distraction um, from, from, their, from their workstations. And the comment was, one of the comments uh, was that, you know, it's really distracting when they can hear and understand the conversation that's happening on the other side of the room. They said it's more distracting than when they can hear and understand the conversation that's happening next to them, because when it's happening next to them, they can join the conversation. But, you know, I, so I don't think it was more distracting, but definitely more annoying when they weren't able to join the conversation that they could hear. Um, and that's what the sound masking really does. It addresses the ability to understand, um, for the most part, understand that conversation that's happening you know, five workstations over in the next private office. You know, the voices, the sounds, they still come through. You're still hearing it. It just becomes less distracting because some of the key characteristics of those sounds are masked over. And it's the characteristic sounds that are really are, are distracting when you know that sound, when you can place the sound, if you understand it, or if you, you hear a song and you can recognize the song instantly, you start singing along, right? That's distracting. Um, maybe you like it, maybe you don't, maybe you hate the song. Um, when you hear music, but you can't actually make out the song in any way, that's a lot less distracting. Um, and so in residential settings, that's not really what you're looking for. Um, you, you really are looking for a much generally a, a quieter environment without those noise intrusions, as opposed to just minimizing the distraction from them. Thank you. Stephen, thank you so much for the great conversation about acoustics and mass timber.